Hello, and welcome to the Healthy Food, Healthy Farms webinar series. Today's Pesticides webinar is the second co-hosted with Pesticide Action Network. Our topic today is the A to Z on atrazine, sex hormones in America's popular pesticide. I'm David Wallinga, a physician with Healthy Food Action and the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy, or IATP. Healthy Food Action, a project of IATP, is a nationwide effort to engage health professionals around the issues in food and agriculture policy that are critical to creating a healthier food system for our nation. After presentations from our two panelists today, we will take your questions. Please submit questions anytime during the webinar, the earlier the better, using the right-hand menu on your screen. Look for the box labeled Enter Question for Staff, type it, and then hit Send. We'll cover as many questions as possible in the 20 minutes or so allowed. Today, I'm joined uh, on the webinar by Dr. Paul Winchester, a practicing physician who's expert in the health of neonates, our smallest newborns, and also by Emily Marquez, a PhD biologist with Pesticide Action Network, who has studied, among other things, the impact of pesticides on the reproductive health of animals. Our co-sponsors for the webinar include the Program on Reproductive Health and the Environment of UCSF, the American Congress of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, and Physicians for Social Responsibility in San Francisco and in Los Angeles. This exhibits the menu where you will lodge in your questions. Uh, our first speaker is going to be Dr. Marquez. As you can see, she's a staff scientist at Pesticide Action Network. Uh, she studied with Dr. Tyrone Hayes uh, as an undergraduate at the University of California, Berkeley, and later did postdoctoral research at Berkeley and at UC Davis. Uh, Dr. Winchester, as I said, is a physician uh, with an appointment as a clinical professor at Indiana University School of Medicine. He has uh, researched and spoken uh, widely on environmental exposures associated uh, with uh, fetal and infant development, as well as life course, life course disease. He has degrees from Stanford University and a medical degree from the University of Colorado. So our first uh, speaker today is Dr. Marquez. And now we're going to switch control of the slides to her laptop. Um, thank you for the opportunity to present and discuss atrazine with you today. Uh, as Dr. Willinga said, I started out doing research as an undergraduate in the laboratory of Tyrone Hayes. And I'm going to talk a little bit about Tyrone's work today as well. Uh, Tyrone is known for his work on atrazine and frogs, as well as his advocacy work, speaking out about the adverse effects of atrazine on frog development. And back then, I was the only person working on reptiles in Tyrone's lab, and I continued studying reptiles and environmental contaminants' effects on the reproductive axis as a graduate student. So most of you are probably familiar with the concept of endocrine disruption, which has been a growing cause for concern over the past 20 or so years. The concept of identifying potential dangers posed by environmental contaminants based on observations from the, the natural world, and, uh, as in wild animal populations, was first defined in Rachel Carson's 1963 book, Silent Spring, which famously described the effects of the pesticide DDT on wild bird populations. Uh, there are a number of routes by which an organism can be exposed to endocrine disruptors, and several major organs or hormonal axes can be affected. 
the EPA Endocrine Disruptor Screening Program is designed to evaluate chemicals for their potential to act as endocrine disruptors. And the EDSP focuses on the reproductive and thyroid hormonal axes. There is also evidence that ADCs can adversely affect behavior. So another point of impact is actually via neuroendocrine effects. But this, um, this mode of action is not studied by the EPA EDSP. As, as yet. Some famous examples of endocrine disrupting compounds are the pesticide DDT, atrazine, and the synthetic estrogen diethylsildestrol, or DES. And DES is a famous case that many of you are probably already familiar with, uh, with an effect that was accurately predicted in rodent models long before the effects were observed in humans. Um, DES was administered to pregnant women in the mistaken belief that it would prevent miscarriages. However, gestational exposure to DES resulted in an increased incidence of cancer in female offspring, including mammary tumors and a rare vaginal tumor. Uh, herbicides are the most used pesticides. And atrazine is one of the most widely used pesticides in the U.S. So I'm pre presenting today to talk to you about why atrazine is a major concern for us. Atrazine runs off after applications in the field into our surface water and is a major contaminant of drinking water supplies across several regions of the United States. Because it was not possible to keep atrazine out of drinking water supplies in Europe, the EU banned atrazine in 2003. Atrazine is known to have endocrine disrupting effects, and despite compelling evidence of harm as modeled in several animal models, the US EPA have not responded adequately. Between 1998 and 2003, an estimated 7 million people were exposed to atrazine in their treated drinking water at levels above state or federal health-based limits. In several epidemiological studies, atrazine exposure has been associated with a number of different health harms in humans, including reduced fertility in males, birth defects, and cancer. And I have more references than what is shown here if anyone is interested. Atrazine has adverse effects on the male gonads. This is a photograph of the gonads of a male frog, a ronopipians, exposed to low levels of atrazine. And these are concentrations of 0.1 micrograms per liter that is comparable to those found in water in the environment. The fixative used to preserve the specimen turned it yellow, and this frog developed ovotestes. These round structures, uh, towards the bottom of the photograph or the posterior of the gonad are eggs that are developing in a pair of testes. Atrazine has, <coughs> excuse me, atrazine has been shown to have various adverse effects on male frogs at low doses. And it's thought that this uh, mechanism is via induction of aromatase, the enzyme that converts testosterone to estrogen. So these figures are also from Tyrone Hayes' work. The dosage is shown up at the top of each figure. And micrograms per liter is the same as parts per billion. So the figure on your left is uh, uh, shows gon a gonad of a frog that has been exposed to this range of doses at the top, shown at the top. And basically, these are histological sections going through the gonad at different regions um, indicated by these black lines. So at one point, there are two testes. And then as you move through the gonad in a posterior direction towards the bottom of the picture, there are ovaries, a testis and an ovary, and finally ovaries at the end in box E. This result was observed in up to 20% of the animals exposed at these dosages. The figure at right shows males exposed to atrazine. And in this experiment, atrazine induced female phenotype in genetic males at the dosage shown at top 2.5 micrograms per liter. I will be calling these atrazine-induced females. 
At left, this is the cloaca and gonad of a control male shown in box A and D. In the center is an atrazine exposed male shown in boxes B and E. And at the right is the cloaca of an atrazine exposed female that was genetically male. And in box F, this is the same animal. This explosion of black and white stuff is basically the ovary of this atrazine-induced female. And that is the egg mass or ovary of the animal. At the bottom, in box C, the animal on top is an atrazine-induced female uh, that is gen genetically male, populating with an unexposed male sibling. And this atrazine-induced female laid eggs. As more studies are conducted, it will be really interesting to learn more about the long-term effects of atrazine across generations of atrazine-exposed frogs. So atrazine has demonstrated gonadotoxic effects in males. And this effect is seen across vertebrate classes. In fish, amphibians, reptiles, there is a recent bird study, and in mammals. So this chemical is ubiquitous in our drinking water and has demonstrated adverse reproductive developmental effects on frogs. And these effects are also modeled in other vertebrate classes. So what is it doing to us? The fact is, we don't really know how many Americans have been exposed to atrazine in drinking water. There's a dearth of information about how much atrazine is actually in our body. And Dr. Winchester, uh, I think, will tell us the story today. US EPA has not prioritized collection of this information. The top graphic, uh, this map of the US, shows USGS data with areas of high atrazine usage in red. And these areas of high usage are correlated with high levels of atrazine in drinking water. This graphic below on the bottom left is based on US EPA data that was adapted for a New York Times article. And this estimates the main regions where atrazine exposure in drinking water occurs. Uh, the Midwest, where much of the corn in the US is grown, is highly affected by atrazine runoff contamination. Although atrazine is not persistent in the environment, there is a heavy seasonal spike that is observed in runoff water and in drinking water supplies. And that's indicated by the red arrows in this graphic. Um, this is also from a New York Times article, and it's based on data from the US EPA. So these summertime spikes have been documented in the EPA's water monitoring of atrazine that occurs in community water supplies across the Midwest and in southern states. PAN, our pesticide action network, works with communities on the ground to collect drinking water samples and test them for atrazine. And we're also analyzing for other pesticides. We do this as a way to engage community members in our work. This graph shows some of the data we've collected. And it shows the average level of atrazine found in drinking water supplies. Uh, these are, were one-time samplings with individual community partners. And these samples were taken in several Midwestern states. So we received samples from municipal water supplies as well as well water samples. And the samples we took did not exceed the EPA level legal limit for drinking water. But I would like to point out that the increased incidences of birth defects correlated with atrazine peak applications as observed in a 2008 study by Dr. Winchester occur at a level well below the EPA legal limit indicated by the second red line down from the top. And nearly all the samples taken in our grassroots science work exceeded the levels known to cause hermaphroditism in frog gonads. So atrazine has been reviewed and evaluated by scientific advisory panels through US EPA. But action to limit atrazine usage or attempts to address the problem of ubiquitous contamination of our drinking water hasn't been addressed. And this is because of the strong influence industry exerts over our regulatory agencies. Atrazine is illegal in the home country of the company that makes atrazine. But in the US, it's declared safe. The story of corporate influence over our regulatory agencies is told in the PAN Land Stewardship Project Report 
on corporate control of regulations titled the Syngenta Corporation and Atrazine. And I'll show a link to that in a moment. Uh, speaking more broadly, the impacts of endocrine disrupting compounds are real and policy must be crafted to protect the public from EDCs. In 2012, an endocrine society statement making recommendations for risk assessment of chemicals displaying low dose effects and or non-monotonic dose response curves. Uh, both of these are frequently observed in EDCs was released. And that statement makes policy recommendations. The Endo Society is an ex excellent example of MDs and scientists uh, and researchers working together. And this statement is something new, I think, that we're seeing in the field of uh, EDC research in particular, where researchers are making concrete recommendations about how risk assessment should be changed in order to improve the work that is done by regulatory agencies and to better protect the public's health. So we found in our work that health professionals are very critical spokespeople with the public. And the most engaged physicians we have worked with in the past write op-eds and letters to the editor and they provide testimony. And the respect and seriousness with which communities and the public in general take those recommendations is really exceptional. So writing letters and the op-eds, that's the deepest level of engagement that health professionals can get involved in. But there's various levels in terms of education and discussion with your colleagues and your work with your patients. So Dr. Winchester will speak to that next. And thank you for listening. As I mentioned, Thank you, Emily. We're going to turn control over to Dr. Winchester, who, as I mentioned, is in Indiana. And if you'll remember the map of the United States that uh, we just saw, Indiana's in right in the middle of that Midwestern portion where uh, atrazine exposure of the human population is thought to be uh, among the greatest. So Dr. Winchester? Thank you. Uh, as, uh, as the previous speakers have mentioned, uh, I'm, I'm primarily a neonatologist, but, but I do research in the area of uh, environmental research. And, and it was really Tyron Hayes' work that inspired us to ask the question of uh, whether Indiana's birth defects and adverse pregnancy outcomes could in any way be linked to the very high exposure that the state has to atrazine. Uh, so this talk is uh, going to go through some of the data that we've looked at, uh, starting uh, first of all, with a re review that um, um, atrazine is not the only environmental contaminant, and, and we simply wanted to point out that when we uh, examine atrazine as a, as a part of the uh, exposure, uh, exposure quotient of a pregnant woman, we're reminded that um, as of late, as, as most recent papers by uh, Tracy Woodworth have demonstrated, um, every pregnant woman, um, unfortunately, is now uh, exposed and saturated to uh, a, a host of chemicals, all of which are endocrine disruptors. Atrazine uh, in, on the list shown in this slide uh, is absent from the list, you'll notice, uh, even though 100% of pregnant women are exposed to at least uh, some of these contaminants, which include flame retardants, plasticizers, PCBs, DDT, uh, and, and uh, various forms of air pollutants. And so we, we want to start talking about atrazine and, and, by respecting the fact that uh, it, it's, it's a member of, of a cocktail of, of teratogens or endocrine disruptors that, poor, that mothers are now exposed to. This was not true in, in the 1940s before these chemicals were invented. The second thing we want to point out is that many of the chemicals shown here are, in, in effect, immortal molecules. They never really degrade in the environment. and uh, so we are adding to that soup. Um, in the reminder then of our uh, being in the, in the bullseye of atrazine exposure and the concern that, that atrazine might uh, disrupt uh, development, we asked a fairly simple question on a national scale. Uh, this slide demonstrates the concentration of atrazine using US Geological Survey data for the entire US over a period of uh, over 10 years. 
and we find a regular recurring, I call it the Matterhorn of uh, uh, atrazine that uh, is shown as a May and June peak. Uh, different regions of the country may peak at different times uh, in different seasons, but on average this is the peak, these are the peak months of exposure. We asked a simple question and that was whether birth defects in the U.S. Uh, uh, are equally likely in, in the months of peak pesticides or, or not. Uh, in this graph we're showing when pregnancies began for these mothers, uh, that is the last menstrual period. And to our surprise, uh, if not horror, uh, the entire population of the U.S. Uh, has a, a spike in their risk of developing birth defects, which is significant and that spike corresponds to the uh, exposure time for uh, uh, peak uh, atrazine levels. So in a sense, this study doesn't prove that atrazine causes birth defects, but it, it could easily have disproved <laughs> that they cause birth defects, and that's, that's the unfortunate thing here. If we continue then and, and consider all the classes of birth defects, we, we were uh, able to show that uh, in the 22 categories of birth defects, 50% uh, of them were significantly increased in risk uh, based on their peak exposures at the atrazine peak. The other 45% of the birth defects uh, also were slightly increased, although that, di that difference didn't reach significance. And I think the important point here is that with the, with the relatively poor way in which birth defects were uh, counted, um, this was a significant finding. Birth defects is the leading cause of infant death, but preterm birth is the second leading cause of, of death in, in all babies in the U.S. And in this study, we're demonstrating in a California sample that during the peak pesticide months, uh, depending on where a mother lives, she can expect to have a relatively shorter pregnancy. Uh, that is, a mother in, very high, in a very low pesticide environment, such as the Green Line, has a relatively uh, lower, has the lowest preterm birth rate, whereas a mother in the highest pesticide counties has the highest preterm birth rate. In addition to that, we see that her peak uh, prematurity rates uh, are peaking right after the, the peak pesticide uh, months. And uh, indeed, when we, when we look at all pregnancies, we see that they're relatively shortened uh, uh, to the maximum in, in the high pesticide months. So this study causes us to uh, suggest that pesticide exposures uh, not only increase the risk of birth defects, but uh, uh, may in fact uh, alter the length of pregnancy and this, this increases preterm birth rates. Birth weights are also impacted by preterm birth or by uh, uh, atrazine. In this study, the uh, pesticides with the highest county uh, levels had the lowest birth weights uh, and uh, the, the lowest pesticide counties had the highest birth weights. Now, birth weights may not sound like an important variable, but um, keep in mind that we now are associated with the, the concept of uh, uh, fetal origin of adult disease. And in that syndrome or, or paradigm, we understand that, that smallness of the baby also re results in smallness of the brain. And unfortunately, then, the smallest babies at any given uh, gestation are the ones at highest risk for long-term problems, including obesity, diabetes, uh, heart disease, shortened lifespan, and possibly co cognitive disabilities. So to have, um, if all I know about you is, is the pesticide uh, exposure that you have by virtue of living in a certain county, if that is the only thing I know about you and I can predict your birth weight and perhaps your lifespan, uh, it's a very daunting finding. In Indiana, we also looked at the peak pesticide, peak atrazine levels in, coral, uh, in correlation with ISTEP scores, which is an academic achievement score. Remembering that uh, the birth size and possibly other factors that de develop your future cognitive ability could be impacted by early exposure to, ex uh, to atrazine. In this slide, we show that, that in fact the highest pesticide months were linked to the lowest uh, ISTEP scores. Uh, those same months were linked to the highest risk of having what was is referred to as a learning disability or uh, individualized educational plan. So once again, we have not proved that atrazine is, is a factor in 
in uh, adverse cognitive performance, but we certainly haven't disproved it. One of my colleagues uh, in the University of Wisconsin, has, uh, Dr. Dr. Warren Porter, has followed this study up in, in rats and demonstrated that, that, they, that in an experimental model, atrazine exposure in utero does alter cognitive performance in, in, the, in the rat. Obviously, the rats didn't get an IQ score, but in their, uh, in their study, they were able to show uh, adverse effects. So this may not be a, a completely uh, uh, irrelevant finding. This next set of slides, I'm, I'm going to try to remind you that when we worry about uh, the exposure of something like atrazine to a, uh, a pregnant population of women, we, we think that when we get a term like endocrine disruptor, we can understand its effect at a, at a mo much more molecular level. And it's, it's, it's nice to know that the uh, EPA, uh, after 16 years, would, would suddenly you know, become able to assess uh, substances as endocrine disruptors. But in the meantime, we've moved on. An endocrine disruptor known as vinclozoline was first introduced into a pregnant rat model by Dr. Skinner, shown in this slide. And in his model, uh, these exposures lasted only a week and were uh, above normal levels uh, in, the, in, in the environment. But they, they're, they're teaching us sort of what, what might be expected. If you give a dose that, that is uh, completely sublethal uh, to the lifespan of the, of the offspring, what he found was that the newborns had no diseases whatsoever. So they weren't small for dates. They, weren't, they didn't have birth defects. They, they weren't premature. And yet, when they grew up to be adults, 90% of the males had diseases of various kinds. And uh, since this study was first done, uh, he has now demonstrated that it occurs uh, w with all the contaminant uh, mixtures that he's so far tested, most of which are found in every pregnant mother. So that we might expect adult diseases that are un otherwise unrecognizable in the newborn that can range from the things that you remember, Emily described DES as causing cancer in the offspring. Uh, in, in these offspring, low sperm count, infertility, cancer, kidney disease, prostate disease, pregnancy abnormalities in the women, in the females, immune dysfunction, high cholesterol, accelerated aging. I say non-sexy scent because three generations later, these uh, animals are still being unselected by the uh, by females that are in, in estrus. Uh, anxiety proneness, polycystic ovaries, and premature onset of menarche. It's just a short list. So the most concerning part of the study was that, that exposures that occur early in pregnancy can, can remain invisible at birth. In this study, in this slide show, I'm showing you the things that are visible at birth, birth defects, preterm birth, and low birth weight. But what Dr. Skinner's work shows is that the invisible uh, at birth is actually the worst for you because it changes your entire life. He further demonstrated that these conditions that were found only in adults then became heritable so that at the third generation of unexposed descendants of the exposed fetus, all of these diseases remained intact at the same, in, at the same rate. So this, shows the, this slide shows the first generation the next, the next, the next. And you can see that in, in this kind of transmission of, of trait, you're actually seeing epigeno epigenomic causes of disease uh, which persist at a higher rate than, than any genetic disease ever would. And so, in fact, he found several methylation sites that were novel for each of the contaminant categories. And it's really this imprinting of DNA that we might be concerned about when it comes to atrazine and other contaminants. And we haven't even brought this up because it's only just now being tested. So at the end, we're, we're forced to say that, that, that the epidemiological evidence suggests that atrazine uh, is probably not good for pregnancy, uh, at least from, from the data that we have. Uh, we can, but we can, uh, we can also ask whether uh, these, um, contam you know, when we're forced to answer questions from individual uh, families that are, that are pregnant, we, we're sort of left with a, a sort of a, a, a vague knowledge of what's truly known and what's what we should be concerned about. In my own practice, I 
Uh, I'm supported by some evidence that, that a switch to organic foods might be useful, that bottled water might be less likely to have uh, contaminants in it than, than uh, water, uh, at least an Indianapolis water company supplied water systems, uh, that time and place of pregnancy might matter. Uh, certainly other contaminants that you can avoid are well worth avoiding, uh, the commonest being tobacco, alcohol, and obesity. And um, we would also encourage everyone to be aware of the way in which we are, in a sense, misinformed, if not placated, by our um, government agencies. We in Indiana discovered that in some months, uh, Indianapolis water could, could contain as much as 30 parts per billion of atrazine. Remember Emily's slide showing that at a tenth of a part per billion, you could convert a male frog into a hermaphrodite. Uh, and that, 30 part, that 20 parts per billion was not reported to the public and considered, not, uh, considered safe by the EPA. Um, we're, we're certainly not, we certainly can't take our water for granted uh, given the level of exposure that we have. So that's the end of my slideshow, and I'll, I'll leave it back to uh, David. Well, thank you to our speakers for some uh, fantastic and provocative presentations. Um, we're going to move into the uh, we're going to move into the uh, questions now, and there's several good questions uh, up here, actually. And the way I'm going to divvy them up and continue to send them because I'm monitoring them, but, but the way we're going to organize the questions is to take a few first that kind of deal with the specifics of the presentations to clarify and then move towards, uh, I think, some of the specific recommendations on what we can tell patients and uh, what uh, uh, health professionals like clinicians may or may not uh, do in terms of uh, calling in regulatory agencies around some of these issues. So. Um, uh, uh, first of all, for Dr. Marquez, just in terms of atrazine's general uh, distribution in the environment, can you explain a little bit how it gets into the drinking water? Um, so the applications occur, I think atrazine is frequently used as a pre-emergent herbicide, so they will, it will be applied to um, the field prior to planting. And then the it doesn't it doesn't bind to the soil strongly. So atrazine will just run off in field runoff um, after rains. Um, especially there's a there are big spikes after rain happens and then it it gets into our water sources uh, in that way. So um, it, it sounds like one of the uh, uh, people on the webinar might be a farmer, and he says, I'm currently considering buying farmland that's been treated with one pound of atrazine per acre. Uh, given what you're talking about, about the persistence of atrazine, or maybe the non-persistence, do you think I should be concerned with buying this land? Hmm. Hmm. Uh, that's interesting. Uh, yeah, I, yeah. I think, yeah. It's amazing. People will ask some very specific questions um, that I I feel not so prepared to answer. I would say in this case, the main thing would be to to not apply atrazine in the future. Uh, so right. I suppose if there's well water, one thing that might be a good thing uh, if you plan on drinking that well water would be to have it tested, and also um, if you use a water filter, that would be something, a reverse osmosis filter or a charcoal filter can remove uh, much of the atrazine in your drinking water. But I, I'd say the first step would be to determine if, if you're going to live on that land where your drinking water supply is. Uh, and the persistence, I, I mean, it's not going to stay there um, for a long time, but I, I can't speak to how long exactly it, it will stay in right. the um, in the soil. It, it's supposed to run off mostly into water. So, are there concerns around atrazine residues on food? 
that people eat, or is that not the exposure route that, that we're concerned about? I think the main exposure route is via drinking water. That would be how most people get exposed. Right. Um, let's see. Lost my questions for a second. Um, let's hang on here. Um, does the Centers for Disease, you, you know, going from sort of the environmental exposure to more the human exposure side, does the Centers for Disease Control monitor for atrazine, either speaker? Uh, I can answer that. Um, in the uh, the Centers for Disease Control has um, been a part of the uh, what's known as the NHAIN study, uh, Report on Human Exposure to Environmental Chemicals, which uh, regularly reports on chemical exposure in the human population. And this study uh, is uh, heavily funded and, and has been going on for decades. And it actually was the results of their screening for atrazine and, and their study uh, from the third uh, and Haynes study that caused me to uh, first uh, become aware of some of the, dare I call it, duplicity in, uh, in what we are told. And this is a 2005 report of the third national report on human exposure to environmental chemicals in which atrazine uh, exposure was reported on page number 396. And in that report, they, they reported on uh, perhaps over three, almost 4,000 patients uh, or subject, subjects that um, uh, were, were screened for atrazine. And I was, of course, thrilled that, that the attempt to, to screen the, the population was performed. But I'm dismayed to find that, that not a single person tested positive for atrazine uh, using uh, the one metabolite that they measured in urine, which was the mercapturate mem uh, metabolite. Uh, thanks to uh, Dana Barr's work from the CDC lab, um, uh, this pr uh, procedure was reviewed and they discovered uh, through a subsample of patients that in fact if they looked for the other metabolites that, uh, that are found in every exposed individual, they would have found those in every person in the sample. But rather than go back and do the appropriate study, um, it has remained on the books as never found in, in the U.S. population and then was subsequently dropped uh, from the panel of, of chemis chemicals that were to be measured by NHANE. So all of that by itself I take as a, I, I fear a, a strongly politically um, in, uh, impaired process in, in which we are left without knowing uh, what percent of the U.S. population actually has atrazine in their urine. The drinking water uh, story, at least in our region, could be up to 70% of the samples will test positive for some level of atrazine. And if that's true, then there's no way that the population exposure is less than 50%. Thank you. Um, but I, I'm going to return to this question about what, whether the issue in terms of people getting exposed to atrazine is one of residues on foods, because it's come up in a couple of different questions. Um, People have asked whether there's evidence that that plants take up atrazine in, into the plant itself. They've also asked um, uh, uh, if uh, atrazine persists long enough <clears throat> to be taken up by or or to to be on organic produce. In other words, flipping it around. Um, if we buy organically, is that is that a way to protect against atrazine exposure? Well, uh, I, there there are several studies that have shown that, that atrazine um, is so endemic in the environment that it can be measured in rainwater, snow, and dust. In fact, it can be collected from your blue jeans if you've been out uh, outside during atrazine exposure. Um, so there has to be some atrazine on a residue on plants. Um, that's a, you know, it's on your rug uh, in your house, so it has to be measurable. I, I just don't know the degree to which the exposure uh, that exposure is contributing to the entire 
uh, exposure okay. in the population. So it sounds like if it's in rainwater, then then yeah, it, you know, it's it's not it's sort of not uh, sufficient just to think that by making certain choices at the grocery store that you're going to be able to avoid exposure to atrazine. Is that right? Right. And Emily made a very good point, which is that, uh, you know, a, a, an exposed farm um, may have had generations of exposure and uh, the well water uh, would be a, a place to start. Uh, there are places like Helena, Montana, where uh, atrazine use was unknown. To be, it, it wasn't being used agriculturally at all. And yet, uh, a majority of the wells uh, in the region became contaminated with atrazine. Uh, so <laughs> it's, a, it's a nasty yeah. molecule because it migrates so readily. Now, Dr. Winchester, you talked about different kinds of health outcomes in the data that associates sort of pesticide or other chemical exposure and sometimes atrazine with, with those health outcomes. And it sounds like that there's issues around birth defects there's issues around um, sort of learning and a neurotoxicity or brain development, uh, and then there's some other issues. So I wanted to kind of break those out a little bit because there's questions about each. In terms of birth defects, there's two interesting questions. One it asks, does Indiana have a mandatory birth defect registry? And, and maybe you want to reflect on why that may or may not be an important question. Yeah, it's a really good question because uh I moved here in 2001 um, from having lived in many parts of the country, and, and my impression as a clinician was that I was seeing more birth defects than, than I should have normally expected to see. So I called immediately the CDC to see what our birth defect rates were in Indiana. This is when I discovered that birth defects still registered on the CDC network as the leading cause of infant death in the U.S. was not being counted in Indiana nor in 12 other states. And immediately asked myself, so the, leading, the world's leading industrial country is allowing 20% of their states to not even have a birth defect registry. Um, my conclusion from that is that we've never had a woman president. <laughs> That's a sort of a joke, but it's a, it's a tragedy to think that the leading cause of infant death would, be, would not be counted. Since then, Indiana has be developed a registry, and in fact, we are working closely with them uh, with, with what amounts to their first uh, amount, their first report of, of uh, birth defects that would be sufficiently large to have meaningful information. So in the meantime, we were forced to use a birth, uh, birth certificate data, uh, which most birth defect uh, epidemiologists shun as, as imperfect. And, uh, we agree that it was imperfect, but it certainly was not less perfect on, in June than any other month. And so we used it as a guide to the simple question we asked was, are, are we across the U.S. more likely to report birth defects in, in months in which babies were conceived in peak pesticide months? So our, uh, our data, if anything, underestimates grossly the, the true numbers. Now as to why birth defect registries have been slow, slow to develop, uh, you know, that's another public health question that, that I find uh, perfect, perplexing at, at best. Right. Um, uh, are there, you, you know, the maps didn't show a lot of atrazine contamination in uh, California where a lot of the uh, uh, agricultural production is, but is there uh, is there use of atrazine? Uh, maybe Emily knows this, either yeah, in golf courses, that. for yeah. example, or and also somebody asked specifically about the Salinas Valley, which some may know is a really intensive uh, uh, produce producing area. We have all that atrazine data. Uh, actually, we we uh, thanks to the um, California reporting system, uh, all the pesticides applied in California have been made available to us to review. And atrazine is used in California, uh, as are several other organophosphate pesticides that are, uh, or you know, California and Florida are the, use two thirds of the pesticides used in the whole U.S. So they're, uh, so the, the San Joaquin Valley is, is a, and the Salinas Valley are extremely hot, heavily exposed. So it was hard to separate atrazine out from other pesticides, um, even though they peak roughly in the same time period. 
Right. So we know that yeah. atrazine is heavily used on corn in, in general. So in, in places where there's corn, that it is likely that atrazine is used. Uh, that's true. California has great a much better pesticide reporting than the rest of the country. Now, in, um, now you mentioned corn, which is important, um, and some folks know uh, uh, that there's relatively newer seed varieties called Roundup Ready corn or Roundup Ready soybeans, which use not atrazine but a different pesticide. So there's one question uh, about, you know, whether we uh, whether we need to worry as much about atrazine if uh, farmers are using Roundup instead for these crops. Well, uh, we are actually working with the U.S. Geological Survey on that question. It, it, it was, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's to our great shame, I think, that, that uh, we, we've studied atrazine and, and Roundup, and uh, the, the parent drug is, is called glyphosate. Uh, extensively in all all vertebrates, um, and yet babies <laughs> and humans, never mind their water, um, have not been measured. So the, the glyphosate data that we have, uh, uh, the U.S. Geological Survey tells us the problem is it's been difficult to develop the assay and it's expensive, uh, but the data suggests that the peak uh, glyphosate months are the same as the atrazine months. Um, of course, the use of genetically modified seeds has actually increased the, the, the total pesticide use in, in all farm countries. And uh, interestingly, one of the new problems with Roundup Ready um, farming is that the uh, weeds are becoming rapidly resistant to Roundup. So we're now using more 2,4-D than ever before, which is a persistent organic pollutant that's not, uh, not good to have in our environment. It, so our concerns about genetically modified seeds is less to do with the genes that are <laughs> making them or we, you know, weed killer resistant, but rather that it encourages the use rather than discourages the use of, of pesticides. The, the two things, the modified seed and the pesticides, were sold by the same company. So you know, from a marketing point of view, that was, that was pretty convenient. Now, uh, um, back to the health impacts. Uh, two things. You, you mentioned uh, um, organophosphates before, and you know there's other classes of pesticides that are either widely used or, or were widely used, like organochlorines, for example. The, in these tests that we've been talking about, is the toxicity of atrazine tested alongside to, uh, some of these other common uh, classes of pesticides to see if there's any synergy? In terms of the effects, do we do we know of any synergy in terms of the effects? Emily, do you want to do you have some data for? Um, I just had a comment on the the last question, um, but sure. just to address the the synergy, I think frequently when studies are done, it, it's an issue of confusing your results. When uh, there have been some studies where people look at synergy, I can't think of any right off the top of my head on atrazine and another compound. Um, but, you know, in order to, it's sort of a catch-22 because we know that all these effects happen in a, in a milieu of environmental uh, contaminants. But when we want to tease out a specific effect designing a study using an animal model, I think um, that becomes a lot more complicated. Right. And then just to uh, comment on the er earlier question, <laughs> I, I mean, atrazine is no longer the number one herbicide used in the U.S., but I believe it's number two. And so we know there's still quite a bit of it being used. Um, I was just reminded by a friend that the biggest use of atrazine in California is in, in forestry. Uh, so they spray forests in California, in the West in general, uh, with atrazine. So we still do get it out here as well. Um, and do, you know what the, do you know what the use is in the U.S.? I, a few years ago, I think it was something like 80 million pounds, or, but I, I don't recall the exact figure. That's the figure that we cite. It's a, a, 
over 76 million, about 76 million pounds used per year. Are so uh, the active ingredient glyphosate, that's the active ingredient of Roundup. That is the biggest herbicide now in the U.S. Right. There is evidence that it's an endocrine dis has endocrine disrupting properties, uh, but uh, as Dr. Winchester mentioned that or discussed, the the other problem is, you know, by selling GMO seed that's engineered to be used with Roundup, you're guaranteeing that Roundup or uh, is going to be used in larger amounts as time goes on. So, yeah, so we got about some data from Argentina that show that a glyphosate that um, interrupts uh, ret retinine or vitamin A dependent uh, development in, in anim animals and um, may explain some of the birth defects that are seen in heavily exposed areas. Now I want to I want to spend the last little bit going uh, back to advice for patients. Uh, it, so, Dr. Winchester, just to elaborate a little bit, there's a lot, a lot of questions about water filtration, and uh, both about whether municipal water systems filters take out atrazine, but also about home filters. And Brita comes up a couple of times. So, you know, what? How should people think about this? Should they, if they're on a municipal system, do they still need to worry? Yeah. The short answer is that the uh, a uh, water system that you're on, to, if it's a, um, some of the larger municipalities have the money to do charcoal filtering and do a pretty good job of eliminating um, or reducing the uh, amount of atrazine. This 20 part per billion story that I told you about in Indianapolis happened when they ran out of charcoal filter. Uh, and, but in our state and many other states, smaller community water systems are, are really we're forced to use surface water at some point during the year uh, which and, and they don't have uh, expensive filtration systems and uh, how well your municipality filters out um, these contaminants could vary substantially as it does in our state um, unfortunately if you call the EPA and ask them uh, you know they won't do testing for atrazine unless really forced and uh, so you, you don't always know. Um, uh, so the home filter systems, uh, the more exotic the better, uh, are probably a good, uh, good idea for everyone. Uh, the bottled water that I use personally, I've, I'm, I have to confess, is brought to me in plastic bottles. And I'm just as concerned about plasticizers in my water as, as I am about astrazine. So I, I don't have the facts. Um, the, the water consumption uh, uh, pr protective effect of changing your water bottle container uh, was first tested by the MBA group at Harvard uh, at the School of Public Health in which they switched to bisphenol free, bisphenol A free water bottles and were able to show that they could reduce their bisphenol A intake uh, that way. Now, bisphenol A and plasticizers are, are both endocrine disruptors that both inter interact with aromatase. So if you can imagine atrazine uh, as a aromatase uh, enzyme stimulator, but uh, combine that with bisphenol A or, or phthalates uh, to get more bang for your buck. Uh, it, it's it's wise to to invest in some kind of water filtration system, I think, uh, and to, to, to and some kind of water purification system. Uh, well water is a thirty dollar Brita filter equivalent to uh, you know a four hundred dollar under the counter filtration system? Uh, again, I would have to see the, the actual testing uh, before I would be confident of the answer. Uh, any of you who have had uh, fish tanks know that you can test for atrazine with, with little kits, uh, but unfortunately the kits uh, allow the water to be, uh, they, they, just pre they just test positive or negative based on be being below three, three parts per billion. And I would rather my my water had no atrazine in it, and uh, so the more expensive kit tests are, are harder to come by. Be a nice right. way to, to insist that our manufacturers uh, get on with. Dr. Marquez, do you have anything to add about the filtration issues? Uh, I'm not sure 
what the, those, the data are based on, but if you look on, there's a website, the national, it's called NSF, National Sanitation Foundation, and they rate uh, water filters. Um, and they're not making recommendations, they're just t telling you, you know, this kind of filter can filter out uh, a given contaminant. But I, I think that an RO system is the most expensive and it filters out the most things, but I believe that from what I've read that a carbon filter, a simple Brita filter can work as effectively um, in terms of atrazine. Uh, Remove reduction or removal as an RO system. So, right. So, um, uh, you, you know, particularly th there's a couple of questions from the perspective of women who are either uh, parents of very young babies or breastfeeding. Uh, and so, there's two sets of questions. One is about whether atrazine is lipophilic, meaning in part, uh, does it accumulate in breast milk? Uh, and the other is kind of more generally about pesticides in breast milk. And does that, how does that impact your uh, advice to women about breastfeeding? Well, I'm a breastfeeding advocate. And, uh, and, and, and until I can demonstrate that um, the, the, the contaminants found in breast milk are, are worse for you than the contaminants found in formula, uh, we'll stick with uh, our recommendation for women to breastfeed as long as possible. Having said that, uh, breast milk as a fatty fluid uh, is overly, overly burdened by lipophilic uh, substances. So uh, we can measure your PCB intake uh, by how much breastfeeding you had and how many fish you ate from the Great Lakes, uh, <laughs> which is a sad commentary. Um, atrazine is not as lipophilic, I think it's more of a, uh, I think it's more water soluble, at least its metabolites are. And I, I'm not familiar with any hard data on atrazine in, in breast milk, although I assume it's there. I, I just don't think it's probably bioaccumulates there as, as the organophosphates do. Uh, those organophosphates and uh, the D, uh, DDTs, the um, PCBs, those, t those tend to accumulate in breast milk. Do, do uh, question came up about protective diets. Are there things that mothers, uh, you know, either breastfeeding mothers or other mothers can eat uh, that maybe are antioxidants or in some other way protective of, against the adverse effects of exposure to atrazine or other pesticides. Um, and there we find it, it's interesting that the, the antioxidant system, the glutathione S transferase system, is a system that, that's folate dependent. And it is interesting that we've all somehow discovered that we need to take more folic acid uh, uh, than, than we would have otherwise gotten naturally through food. And my my I, my suspicion is that folic acid uh, isn't really deficient in, in us so much as it's being consumed by the, uh, the multiple uh, oxidizers that we have in our, system, in, our, in our environment now. That would tempt people perhaps to take mega doses of folic acid, and that's a bad idea also. Uh, the most interesting thing about folic acid is that it is the prime methylator, the prime uh, carbon donor. For the, for the not only the antioxidant system, but also for the epigenomic system. And it has already been shown in animals that it, it, taking too much of it can lead to just as much trouble as taking too little. So the recommendation is to take a multivitamin that contains the appropriate amount of folic acid. And, and if, if I had one wish for all pregnant women or to be is that they should have been on folic acid for a year before they conceived which has been shown to reduce their risk of premature birth and birth defects. Why we don't have a national policy in which all women of reproductive age are recommended to have uh, a vitamin before conception, uh, I don't understand. Uh, but even the term prenatal vitamin doesn't work on women if they start it after they've learned that they're pregnant. It doesn't help them. So we would 
Uh, so vitamins are important as a pr pr protection against the oxidant stress of, of these contaminants. Um, we're tempted to think of these. To, go ahead. No, I was just going to say we're we're kind of running up on the hour, so I wanted to just wrap up with one, maybe one more question, if that's okay. Sure. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, uh, give you an opportunity for some closing thoughts. So my question it gets back to uh, this idea of atrazine in rainwater and groundwater. You know, obviously we can't put the onus on uh, parents or individuals uh, to address those sorts of problems. We've got to think about policies. So wh why does the U.S. still allow atrazine use if there are so many other countries that don't? And what, what could the people on this call do about that? Emily, you want to go take a shot? <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> Um, that's a great question. Thank you for asking that. Um, I think I, I, I was just recently at a UN Environment Program meeting uh, under the, the Stockholm Convention, which works to ban persistent organic pollutants. And, and some of those pops are pesticides, such as DDT. Um, the US is not very engaged in the, re the U.S. regulatory agencies are slow, too slow to act, and we think it's because of the strong influence of, of corporations over that process. Um, if you look through, for instance, the EPA um, scientific re uh, review panel, um, there's a place where you can submit comments um, on pesticide reviews, uh, on various chemical reviews. and Industry always has a presence there. Uh, the NGOs, you know, we, we're trying to keep up. We have some campaigns, um, but we also need uh, people in our communities to get engaged as well. Uh, as there's there's various ways that you could get involved. Uh, one of them that we at PAM, of course, like to recommend is that you sign up for our updates on pesticides. And there are simple things you can do to take action um, in our weekly alert. Um, you can write letters um, and just, you know, vote in that way by, by showing that you have an interest and a concern and keep on chipping away at it. Well, I think we should uh, wrap up presenters and I want to thank you so much for your incredible uh, slides and, and comments today and thank you all in the audience for joining us for the Healthy Food, Healthy Farms webinar series. Keep an eye out in March uh, for our webinar uh, with Dr. Robert Lustig on uh, fructose in the food system. Uh, uh, and you can look for that at healthyfoodaction.org. Um, we will uh, probably early next week be posting a, uh, a, a copy of this webinar, of this presentation. So if you uh, know of folks that have missed uh, being here live, they should be able to see it there. And while you're on that website, uh, join our network to, to become part of a growing voice for healthier, more sustainable food systems. There's also links there to current policy actions and recordings of past webinars. For those on social media, you can follow us on Facebook with Twitter at HF Action uh, or follow me at Food Doctor. And again, I want to thank Dr. Winchester and Dr. Marquez uh, for presenting today. So thanks to all of you for joining us and until next time, uh, thanks again. Thank you. Thank you.